And so, uh, again, just kind of the, the chart out the next five weeks or so of programming. Uh, so we have basically, in, in, the, in, the, in the Psalter, the church's use of the Psalter, we have Psalms 140 through 144, Psalms of deliverance from personal or national enemies, which don't usually make it on the lectionary as we've discovered. And so, but then you get to, as you get to the end of the Psalter, you have the Psalms of praise, and those, those Psalms do get in. So we're going to go, you know, basically Psalm, and, but we're coming to the end of the Psalter. I mean, we're almost there. So it's like well, Psalms 140 through 144, and then our final Psalm will be 149, which is a Psalm of praise, but it has some elements in it, has the Psalms too, which the church, you know, lectionary feels is uh, inappropriate for Sunday content. <laughs> um, but that's, you can leave that for the preacher. You know, so, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, as, as you know, as someone who's in who's you know in clinical practice, sometimes some uh, you know constructive epithets um, and and uh, profanity can help break a situation. You know, and, you know sometimes you just have to swear to you get people to relax. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> sometimes you just got to swear to get people to relax. Um, so uh, so Psalm 140. So let's uh, open with prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of the Holy Scriptures. We pray that. Uh, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would transform them from signs on a page into channels of grace into our hearts. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, we have, a, again, a psalm of deliverance, which, as you'll see, is, ha, is in a different, is, has some different emphases in psalms of lament. Right? So, lament is kind of what basically... You haven't been delivered. You're suffering. You know, like you're, you're, you, it's happened, and you're suffering. This is kind of like you know, kind of proactive, you know, imprecations, uh, you know, towards one's perceived opponents. So it begins with, "Deliver me, O Lord, from evil doers. Protect me from those who are violent, who plan evil things in their minds and stir up wars continually." And in a sense, you you know deliver us from evil. Now, of course, in the, if, for those of you who know a little bit about the Greek and the Bible and about the English translation of it, that you know deliver us from evil is actually in the Greek it's the evil one. In English, they in, you know they they cut they 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 cut that out. That it's it's. You know, it's implied in the Greek. It's like it's you know, it's kind of from the evil one. It's a, it's a much more personal enemy uh, that Jesus is talking about. And so, deliver me, O Lord, from evil ones, from the wicked. Right. That's what's at at bottom here. And in many ways, again, in as we walk the way of Lent and hear the Psalms through a Lenten framework and a, through the framework of the Passion, we remember that Jesus submitted himself. Right? So that in a sense, we pray for deliverance from evil, understanding and giving thanks for Jesus' submission to evil and specifically to violence in order to demonstrate God's redemptive power over evil. And violence that the the deliverance from evil and violence and you have that basically in that parallel you, they're in that parallel position in the in the verse in the in the poem right so you usually have you know part a of the, of the verse is and then you have a parallel in part b so you in many ways in the psalms you can look at those words like evil doers and violent they, they're in the poem they're supposed to cast light on each other in the sense that wickedness, the essence of wickedness is violence, right? Violence against the other, the coercion of the other, in whatever form that takes, right? It may not, you know, can, as we all, you know, that we've been made aware of, that is that violence, it doesn't only come in physical forms, that it can come in the form of emotional patterns that are abusive, but like all coercive patterns that, de-self the other. I guess I would define violence as the de-selfing of an other, uh, basically the turning of an other into an object. That's what, that's violence. And you can do that in all kinds of ways, 
you don't have to, you don't have to hit them, you know, give them a knuckle sandwich, as my grandpa would say, um, you know, but you don't have to give them a knuckle sandwich to, to commit violence, that violence is, is through words, you know, that that's, and through, again, patterns of devaluation. And again, that's one of the things that we need to be alive to is that it's violence is not just that evildoers or the, the wicked um, is a kind of a corporate reality, right? In a sense, it's not only an interpersonal reality, but the Psalms also name it as a systemic reality, right? A, a, like a, that wickedness, evil doing, in a sense, is a shared enterprise. You know, and it can take the form of, again, institutional evil, institutional violence. And they stir up wars continually. In verse 2, who plan evil things in their mind to stir up wars continually. And in some ways you have there the, the, is, is the inclusion of both of kind of secret evil and then open conflict. And, and just in that very artful phrase, in terms of they, they, they plan evil things in their minds, so kind of that, that secret plotting wickedness, but then you have make war, stir up wars continually as part of that kind of when it comes out of the open. And both, both, we need God's help and protection from both um, when they come up into our lives. They make their tongue sharp as a snake's, and under their lips is the venom of vipers. And it doesn't, you know, again, this should, you know, clue in to Genesis 3, to, and so and we understand the, the tongue being as sharp as a snake's being a reference to the satanic lie, the, 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 the demonic liar that stirs up conflict between human beings. And this is, again, this is part of it. This is a deeply uh, biblical way of looking at evil in a sense that you, in a, in a, that, that, um, that the people can be agents of a spiritual power, right? In the sense, be the, you know, kind of, people often think of, because of the movies, People often think of like dem demonic possession as like, blah, you know, it's like, you know, green vomit and, you know, head turning around and all that stuff. It's like, oh, that's what demonic possession is. Well, I'm not possessed. <laughs> you know, like, woo, you know, thank God I'm not doing that, so I'm, I'm good. And, but, but in a sense, the, the deepest, the spiritual tradition of the church is that in a sense, demonic oppression or possession is a much more subtle thing. And in a sense that, are one of the imagery, images that the patristic authors will use is that in a sense our souls are like a city and they're like bad parts of town. You know, that we, we got parts of our lives that are bad parts of town and that aren't in control of the authorities. And when your thoughts go there, bad things happen. And, you know, and so that's part of what, in a sense, that, you know, in Jesus, he takes every thought captive. In the sense that in Jesus and his liberating forgiveness and mercy and love, that he, in a sense, liberates, he's like, that, again, this is a patristic, this is the people that, this is, it isn't original to me, this is in the tradition, where, in a sense, Jesus is like a, is like a king who's come to free an occupied city. Has, has a model of redemption of the individual Christian soul in a sense like and or or in a sense I'm sending in the National Guard to control a riot in your heart right and and, and that that's for, so that we have these parts of ourselves so most of the time you know for most of the city very livable right prosperity and other you know but then we have all these other places that are not in control of the authorities where that are not flourishing that are kind of like, you know, basically the, 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 the crack houses of our hearts, right? The boarded up houses in our own hearts that in a sense we need to be protected against and need to have redemption from and God's healing applied. And as Augustine would remind us, sometimes it's disciplinary. Right? Sometimes in order to take back those parts of our hearts, there needs to be a disciplinary 
um, action by God. Under their lips is the venom of vipers. And so, again, it's this... It's really a power, you know, a powerful poetic image of 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 folks who, um, you know, I think like of like gaslighting people. You know, it's like it's like where words are are like you know like these fangs that have venom in them, and leave a mark that spreads. And it's a you know again the ash and those sorts of vipers were a threat. You know, that, that, that was the thing that happened, right? It's like in their homes, you know? He's like, yeah, yeah. like, every, you know, read, read, read your Kipling and Ricky Tiggy Tabby. Everybody see that? Or am I dating myself? But yeah, like the mongoose, and, you know, and the, the cobra. You know, but, but you know, again, in a, not, in a time not too long ago, snakes would get into houses, right? And so the idea that in our own homes, there's the, the danger of venom and of, poison spites. Guard me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Protect me from the violence who have planned my downfall. And this downfall is, you know, can either be understood either a social downfall or a moral downfall. You know, and as I say, you know, in our brokenness, when, when I was a... Um, you know, teacher, I was, my first year out of college, I was a seventh grade history teacher. And I, I became convinced that like basically hell, in hell, everybody's in seventh grade. It's like, that's what hell is. You go back to seventh grade and, and you just live like that forever. You know, like that's, you know, and you have like, you know, lots of, you know, you know, yeah, you have adult toys. So I'd like to say, you know, the Episcopal Church is really a tradition for everybody who hated junior high. It's like, basically I should ask people, did you like junior high? Oh, you did. Let me recommend this wonderful church just down the road because, like, you may not like it here. If, if, like, if junior high was good for you, you may not be an Episcopalian. So, uh, you know, so like, you know, so seventh grade junior high is like teaching. Oh my gosh! But then the year after that, well, they fired me. That's a long story. But then they fired me, and so um, what? I'm sorry. They right sized the middle school, and we're sorry. We don't have a position for you. But. Um, but the uh, then I went to another school and taught fourth grade homeroom, and that and so I basically in the kingdom of God we're all in fourth grade. So that's basically we that's, you know we did, we get younger in the kingdom. We just go down to fourth grade in the kingdom of God. Um, and so in a sense, you know, but I think of like the junior high, you know, those movies that they used to show, like you know when you when it was back when you remember just saying no, and um, you know it's like all oh, the cool kids are doing it. Uh, you know, I'll be your best friend, uh, but. In a sense, those are like those venomous words, right? The, the, the folks who put pressure on us to betray our most deeply held values and principles, sometimes in exchange for approval, and that could be the most dangerous thing. Again, that's the spiritual fathers. It's when things are going well, when people are saying, you know, as Jesus says, you know, you know, be, you know woe to you when people say well of you. Then you know you're in real trouble. Right? Um, as opposed to those who would slam you on because you're proclaiming the gospel. There's a different, you know, because you're proclaiming the gospel. So, in a sense, those who would seduce us with praise or approval in order to get us to betray our most deeply held principles or promise us what we want most deeply in our hearts, that in a sense, we, you know, that in some ways, like what we need, what we feel we need in order to be, um, to be whole, that's, that comes out of our brokenness, right? That, that in a sense, um, you know, for example, I'll just say, you know, for me, right, in my default setting, I need to be right. I don't care if you don't like me, as long as you acknowledge that I'm correct. <laughs> I don't need to get what I want, as long as you know that what I want, I should be getting. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, as long as you acknowledge the correctness of my case. And that's just my, that's, that, I was just right, you know, that's from early on. That's, that's early childhood stuff, right? And um, in a sense that to try to, if someone offers that, right, it's like, can I back away from the need to be right in order to be true to my most deeply held convictions and principles. Right? 
That's, that's, I mean, that's the wrong price for it. Now, each of us has different stuff, typically, that, a different need. It might be for people, it might be for liking. I mean, so some people, they, as long as you, I don't care what you think of me as long as you like me. And so if people will give you liking you, then you're good. Right? But it may be, whatever it is, we, we have a need, a deep need that's, a, that's coming out of our brokenness, that if somebody is willing to meet that need, we're willing to trade, as Esau does, our birthright for a bowl of porridge. That's, in a sense, that's, that whole story, by the way, is the story about Israel. Basically, what are you willing to give up to get ahead in the world? What, do you give, what are you willing to give up in order to just get these pagans to like you? Are you willing to trade in your birthright, which makes you different in your relationship to the Father, the one true God, or are you willing, are you just going to take it just to give it your dinner, right? So that's what we are all faced with. In a sense, those who, the idea is that there's, that the violent, those who would make us less than who we are in God's eyes, that the violent who would take that, that, identity as God's beloved child away from us would, in a sense, plan our downfall. Um, and again, it's, it's not like there are people in a room with green visors, you know, green eye shades, you know, saying, like, how can we get from to No, that's not how, but it's basically the idea is here is that those who, again, have a sense and intuition about your weakness and just go right to it. And for Augustine, it, this is actually one of his, you know, his better hot takes if you will, on the Psalms. For Augustine, he says that basically the only way you can truly fall, the, the, in a sense, the only thing that is a true downfall is to lose Jesus, is to lose your relationship with Jesus. That no matter if anything else can happen to you, but if you, but if you lose that, that's the true downfall. So he, he hones in on those who would take you away. And again, in his culture, there's, pagans were still around. Right? So they were, you know, as they are with us, just in a different form. Now they're called modernists. Um, but, you know, but, uh, you know, the, but in the sense that for Augustine, that's what we have to be guarding against is the downfall of losing our faith in Jesus and his way of love. The arrogant have hidden a trap for me. Also translated from the arrogant, or I think I like actually the translation of the proud. Because that, that ties it into a lot more, you know, a lot more, a lot of a more text with which we are familiar. But the proud have hidden a trap for me with cords. They have spread a net along the road. They have set snares for me. And cords here again are like is it ropes? Yeah, that's what it's like. A cord is a rope. Is a rope. And um, and so the the cord, the rope, is the symbol for sin. With, with sins, or with sin, they have spread a net, basically temptation. With their own proclivity to sin, their own rebellion. So again, what part of what we come into now, what we begin to understand as we move through this poem and through this psalm, is that this is someone, the, the prayer of the psalm is someone who's seeking deliverance specifically from, in a sense, moral danger, from it's not the like, kind of like, you know, they're, they're trying to take my land at the gate and they're, you know, corrupt judges. That's, those are other psalms, right? But this psalm is really about the danger of, of moral surrender, of moral surrender. And um, this is actually, so, you know, you've, how did they catch, you know, you wonder, so before, before shotgun and birdshot, how did they bring birds down? You ever think about that? Like it's like because it's, they're they're pretty fast, actually. You know, you can't. They won't let you come right up to them, right? And say, oh, you know, here, birdie, birdie, birdie. Oh, I got you in my lasso. Yeah, you know, that's not how. I, so basically, what they do is they use nets. So they get close enough, and they, you know, for like you know, like flock of birds in a tree, and then they would take a, a weighted net, just like fishing, really. It was like except it was in the air, and so they would just take it, and then they would sneak up as close as they could to the tree and throw the net high above so then it lands. So the, the instinct of the bird, right, is to is to fly up in and they and what the bird is they fly up right into the net, which then has the weights and then it brings them down. Then you just cinch up, you know, you cinch up the net and then you got a bag full of, of pigeons, right? Um, that's how that's how they got the birds. Um, that was bird hunting back in the day. 
uh, before West Texas. Uh, so, um, so the again the 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 image here of with cords spreading a net is that we're the turtle dove, we're the defenseless creature in many ways, and that those who would snare us, it's literally that's what a snare was. A snare was a net that gets thrown over and traps the prey. And that in a sense that evil and temptation is like a net that gets thrown up and in some ways uses our own instincts against us. You know, in a sense, if, because if the bird can go down and out, like if the bird instead takes off and jumps off the branch and goes down, then get out from under it. But the instinct is to fly up, right? Because, you know, because they're, they're worried, you know, they've been trained, birds have been trained to move for, you know, those birds, putters down, right? And so up is always a safe direction. And so in a sense, it's the idea here that the psalmist is trying to tap into or is that, that sin and wickedness can often use our deepest instincts to trap us. That's what I'm talking about, like those default positions, those default needs that we fall back on when we're under stress or we're tired or we're discouraged and then we want that thing that we've been trained from childhood to want. You know? And um, and uh, so that's the that's the image here. It's and so along the road they've set snares for me. Right? That you know they're just waiting. And um, has it, you know and it, so Augustine will say so you know it's, he you know Augustine will say now notice how it says along the road not on the road. And so Jesus says I am the way, which in way and road is the same word in Greek the hanos. And uh, like, I am the way. And so if you stay on the narrow path, like, you know, it's like, don't try to, you know, it's like, you're, you're good. You're good Christians, you know, just stay on that path. Um, because the law, if you go off the path, they've set, that's where they set, that's where sin sets its snare. That's clever. But anyway, uh, you know, so, you know, pretty, pretty basic illusion. But again, for us, we can recognize, you know, what we've been doing in this time as we go through the Psalms is recognizing how the Psalms reckon with the true gravity of the human moral predicament. Um, and so again, this is, this is not like a lament where we're righteous and the wicked are doing clearly illegal things. This is where it's more like we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable. We're helpless, and evil's preying on that, on our moral vulnerability. So that's the situation, right? So that, like, but in in many ways, a, a psalm of deliverance is structured similarly to a psalm of lament that we've had, like the provocation. Here's the situation that that we're in, and then it will get to the response. So, what is the response to our trouble? It's confession of faith. I will I say to the Lord, you are my God. You are the only reality. You, I mean, that's what God, to be God means, is to be the only reality. You are the standard by which all things are measured. You are the one who has everything in the hand of your providence. We respond to temptation and to moral vulnerability through prayer. I will say to the Lord, that's prayer. We respond to our temptation and to our vulnerability through prayer. And specifically a prayer that acknowledges that God is God. That's where we start out with. Which may not seem you know, too complex, but boy, that's hard to put into practice. Right? I like to say, you know, that, that in so many ways we live in, in our, as we tread the, the, the line of the, the road, <laughs> I, the, um, in, 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 uh, in backpacking, in, in backcountry trails, there's this, there's this uh, a technical term called the critical edge of a trail. I don't know if you know, the, the critical edge of a trail is where, because basically they're carving trails like along the side of a mountain. And so, 
in a sense, it's the critical edge is where basically you have to angle it in such a way that you know if you if it gets worn off, then it'll keep eroding. And so the critical edge is using that angle so that the water you know water that falls goes off the trail and that the trail holds up. So that if people walk on that side of the trail, the trail will hold. And the and so basically we try to train the scouts do not walk on the critical edge. Because what that does is it wears it, it wears it down and it damages the trail and then the trail will erode and won't be a trail anymore, right? And so, so many times in our lives, if you're anything like me, you find yourself walking on that critical edge, right? Where our lives can erode if we stay on that edge. It erodes, the, the, the solid ground underneath our feet can erode and, by the way, we erode it for those who come behind us. That's the other, it's like, yeah, you're fine on the critical edge. It's the, it's the crew behind you and the crew the next year after the rains come that, you know, they're going to suffer for your walk on the critical edge. So we, we acknowledge that, that God is God. He's the ground upon which we stand. Give ear, O Lord, to the voice of my supplications. I want to draw attention, like, not essentially not to the supplications themselves, but give ear to the voice of my supplications. In some ways, this is a way of saying to God that, hey, I'm going to throw some words at you. But what I really want you to pay attention to is not the words, but my voice. Hear me. Hear what's, what I'm trying to express that my broken language and my broken heart can't get right. Hear my voice. When our children are pre-verbal or pre-language, right, we can still understand them because we hear their voice. We know what a cry, you know, we, like, you know, the, the mothers and, to a lesser extent, fathers in my experience know the different kinds of cries. Like, what is, like, what are they wanting? Is it a hungry cry? Is it a cry I'm wet? Is it a cry I'm just lonely and I want you to take me out of my crib? I don't want to go to bed right now cry. You know, <laughs> you know, is a cry that I'm in my room because I've been naughty cry. You know, what, all those, but what we hear as their parent is their voice, not their words. And so the psalmist, again, is that wonderful thing, it was like in the, in the, uh, eloquence of poetry, the psalmist confesses the failure of language to communicate that which is deepest. And so we ask God to listen to our hearts and not to our words in the confidence that God has a loving parent does so. He listens to our hearts and not to our words. Not the words themselves, but the heart that speaks them. That's our voice. Listen to my voice. Listen to the voice of my supplications. O Lord, my Lord, my strong deliverer. And there, and you had the, the difference. I don't know if in your translation it has a capital L O R D. And then my, so basically it would be basically, O God, my king. That would be another way. That's what it's trying to get at. But, you know, Yahweh. My Lord, my King, my strong deliverer, you have covered my head in the day of battle. And again, just for moderns who may not understand, what is it? What is that about? Is you know, basically, you have to imagine in, in battle, one of the biggest dangers is missiles. You know, you know, coming over the coming over the uh, the front of people who are whacking at each other, and you're you're in back of all the people whacking at each other, but. <laughs> And so for the Lord to cover your head means protect me from basically unseen dangers. Protect me from the arrows I can't guard against because I'm busy holding my shield here, right? So, you know, typical infantrymen, poor guys, <laughs> you know, they, they've got their shield here and they got their sword here. They're not looking up there. And so it's like, Lord, be my shield from above. You know, protect me from the things I can't see, from the things I can't protect myself against. Cover my head in the day of my spiritual and moral battle. Do not grant, O oh Lord, the desires of the wicked. Do not further their evil plot. Those who surround me 
lift up their heads and then kind of in, in parentheses like in pride. That's so it's like to have a head lifted up as opposed to one bowed down. So here the, the righteous sufferer, the vulnerable sufferer, is one who has his or her head bowed to God in worship and in trust. Versus the proud who have their heads lifted up. That's what that all that language in, in the psalm that says, you know, you have you know, you have lifted up my horn is like oh, you know, they say, you know, that, that, that's all that lifting up stuff is like when you know, so the psalmist experience it basically is like when a king, you know, it's like if you if you watch the crown or see you know like medieval things, you know, King Arthur, uh, you know, and you come in and then so you enter the presence of the monarch and what do you do? You better you better kneel or, and bow, and then the king would, might say something like, "Arise." And so the psalmist, whenever, whenever it talks about "you lift up my head," is basically the praise for a god right, who says to a creature, "Arise." You know that 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 God is so merciful, so loving, so uh, condescending in the old-fashioned sense of the word, not our modern sense. But kind of meaning someone who truly comes down to be with us, that he is willing to say, rise, ra be raised up. You can look me, in a sense, spiritually, you can look me in the face. You can rise up and see me. And that's the praise of the psalmist. But those who lift up their heads in their oppression of others... To keep other heads bowed down, this is what the psalmist is working on here. Those who surround me lift up their heads. Let the mischief of their lips overwhelm them. Let burning coals fall on them. Let them be flung into pits. No more to rise. And of course, the pit is not just a hole in the ground. It's death. It's shale. Right? It's the V pit. Do not let the slander be established in the land. Let evil speedily hunt down the violent. And as we've been going through the Psalms, you know that that's in verse 11b. That is the classic kind of psalmist understanding of evil and its consequences. That it says evil devours itself. That there's this kind of, that, that there's a self-consuming in the long run. In the short run, he needs deliverance. In the short run, they've lifted high their heads. But in the long run, evil is a self-consuming power. That it doesn't have, in a sense, a, um, a, a, a future of its own. And, uh, you know, Jesus would get, gets at this by, you know, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. That's, that's a classic kind of psalmist kind of, you know, it's like, the psalmist could have told you guys, right? If you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Evil consumes itself. So that, um, you know, again, as in, in a modern, you know, as the kids say these days, it's, you know, karma is, you know, uh, you know what karma is. But, but that's psalmist. That's the psalmist. So, yeah, dang right. Um, I'm only going to swear in the sermon. So, uh, <laughs> but, um, but uh, so that's the, you know, the, the, that self-consuming nature of evil that, in a sense, that the, the righteous, that's why you kind of, you, you want to pull back from it because... It's kind of, it's, it's swirling in the bowl. And you don't want to get taken down in the whirlpool with it. You, you know, kind of stand back from that. Know that the final victory will be God's and evil will consume itself and be no more, right? And the thing about a self-devouring evil is one, it basically, it will go to nothing, right? And it's kind of like that, if you, those of you who remember, I'll trigger you about math, right? You know, that, that as, it, as it approaches that asymptote, as, it, as the graph goes to zero, eventually when it gets out there to infinity, it's going to be zero, right? Because, you know, 1.9.8. So that's what evil is. That's what's going to happen to evil is ultimately it, in the eschaton, it will be rendered zero. There will be nothing there. Um, I like So burning coals, I just want to raise up in verse 10a. Uh, I, let me uh, let me give you the a new the New Testament the most you know my my most memorable or what I what I you know is uh, I wouldn't say it's famous necessarily but it's a, a New Testament use of that phrase of the psalm. Um, ah, here it is. Okay, this is Paul in Romans twelve. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. 
If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will keep burning coals on their heads. <laughs> you know, but, but you see how Paul, that's the messianic inversion, the Jesus Messiah inversion of imprecation. Basically, the imprecatory psalm is an original context of burning coals, like burning fire, we're going to burn you to the ground, you know. But for Paul, he's, in a sense, he turns that image around so wonderfully by saying, actually, it's a, it is a, you keep burning coals of, of mercy, which will burn down their hatred for you. That's, 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 the, that's Paul's appropriation of this psalm verse. I love it. I just, you know, again, it's just the way that psalm, because it's such a great example of how Paul read the Old Testament. That that the Old Testament, when pulled through the crucifixion of Jesus and his and the mercy that God shows to humanity through that, and the victory of love and life on the other side of it, that it turns around all those ways, you know, all the original context and turns it upside down in a paradoxical and delightful way, so that the burning coals we heap on others are burning coals of kindness. That's actually my my mother used to say. And my grand she got from my grandmother's. He burning coals of kindness on their head. That's what he used to say. It's like whenever somebody irritated you, like well, he burning coals of kindness on their head. <laughs> and I didn't have the kid. I'm like, what is that about? I don't know. I didn't understand what that meant. But uh, but now I do, and I appreciate it. I know that the Lord may. So here we end, like so many times in the Psalms, we end with the confession of faith. I know that the Lord maintains the cause of the needy and executes justice for the poor. That's who the God of the Bible is. The God of the Bible is known by maintaining the cause of the needy, executing justice for the poor. That's who God is. If, if you, you know, in a sense, if you're worshiping a God who doesn't do that, you're worshiping the wrong God, right? You may be a monotheist, you're just worshiping the wrong God. <laughs> you, know, like, you, know, so, you know, it's like, that's the thing. It's like, oh, we all worship the same God. Uh, describe your God. <laughs> then I'll tell you if we're worshiping the same God. Because my God executes justice and supports the needy and is concerned for the brokenhearted and binds them up. That's my God. I, uh, so you tell me about your God. But that's the God I worship, the one God revealed in Christ Jesus. This is the character of the God of Israel who Jesus then brings forth in the flesh. Surely the righteous will give thanks to your name. In this context, the righteous are those who, again, who hold back from the power of wickedness in a, in a sense that they, they are willing to trust in God's deliverance and trust in his ways and not be seduced by the praise and the approval of the wicked, not be seduced, is the righteous of the one who overcomes the instincts which put us right into the net. That's what, in this context, that's what the righteous one is, is the one who's escaped the snare of the fowler, right? the snare of the bird catcher, those cords of temptation and approval or whatever else you were taught to need from the time you're about this high, all those things that you have, by God's grace and by depending and identifying yourself, rooting yourself in God's love and plan for your life, you've steered clear of that by his grace. Surely the righteous will give thanks to your name. The upright shall live in your presence. And so the, the, the deliverance from the moral danger which afflicts the vulnerable, the broken, i.e. you and me, <laughs> ends on being in communion with God. Those who are made to stand upright, so there are those who, again, as I said before, are those who lift up their head and then those who are made upright by the one high God shall live in your presence, shall live in God's presence, shall have communion with God. That is the destination of those who 
ask God to help them resist temptation is communion. And that is, in a sense, the future into which we're called to lean in our vulnerability is to lean on God's love, which delivers us. And along the way, of course, burning coals <laughs> on those bad parts, those parts in our hearts that need redemption. Amen. Okay, I'll see you all next week. We'll Psalm 141. We'll keep getting delivered in various ways. <laughs>